Kwe, Dangako Gilwell, uh, Glee Wesnail, Justin Sapier, No JL, Wolastagug, Naga, Wabanu, Gewig, Uliwan. Hello there. What I said was, hello, how are you all doing? My name is Justin Sapier. I come from the beautiful and bountiful river, and I am one that dwells in the Dawnland. Thank you very much. And I'm Timothy Bjorn Jones. I'm a visual artist, I'm a writer, and an educator, and uh, I'm non-Indigenous. So, Justin, you were saying that you're someone who dwells in the Dawnland. Could you talk a little bit on what that means? Uh, sure. Uh, Dawnland, to my people, uh, East Coast, um, it's called the Dawnland because we are the first people to see light on Turtle Island. So uh, that is our homeland. It's, it's called Dawnland. Uh, it's in time immemorial. It's been called Dawnland, and that's what we call it. And that's exactly what it is. We're the first ones to see the light, so it's, we're the first ones to see the dawn, so it is the Dawnland. And I am one who dwells in the Dawnland. I am uh, Bizkudin Makati and Wollastoque, so I am Passamaquoddy and Maliseet. But the way to differentiate myself is that I am one that, that's what I love, I love the word Wabanugawig, and it means one who dwells in the Dawnland. And that's what I consider myself, and that's why I consider everybody that really, <laughs> there's a difference too about dwelling in the Dawnland. You have to take care of the Dawnland, so we can get into a lot deeper, but it, there's a bigger meaning to it, but that's basically the gist of it. Perfect, yes, and uh, I know on the article I recently just interviewed you for, and end to the age of waste. That's something that we, we touch on is the responsibility that comes from dwelling in an area. Indeed, and that's hopefully one of the messages we can get out there is that uh, we all dwell in the Dawnland. So, <laughs> yes, the age of waste is over. So, wasting stuff and uh, squandering resources, stuff like that, uh, hopefully uh, it is coming, but hopefully it comes much, much sooner. But yeah, I want to. It's actually taking, it, taking your space. You have your space, and our space is in the Dawnland. And we're very lucky because it's one of the most beautiful places on the face of the earth. So if we don't take care of it, we're going to have to watch out what's going on. Absolutely. It's a beautiful way to put it. So I see you brought, you brought some chisels with you. Yes. So I noticed that um, you, know, like you've, you have a mallet, you have chisels, you've got a piece of your work and some paddles with you, but I don't see any power tools. <laughs> yes. Uh, traditional carving. I said, I'll, I'll turn this around on you here in a couple of minutes, but, uh, but yeah, traditional carving. Yeah, it was a way for me personally, um, not that I don't like power tools, I like things getting done fast, but when I traditionally carve and everything's done by hand, it just, I always say it's about putting love into an object and I, it's a way I can put more love into an object. Um, and it's actually a way for me to personally get closer to my roots. When I do something by hand, it just makes me feel like I'm in the right place and I'm doing something that my ancestors have been doing for a long time. And, <clears throat> and not a lot of people do traditional carving anymore. We're in, the, we're in an age of uh, power tools. Everybody wants to get everything done fast. So, so yeah, so my question is to you, that's, that's what started me on my traditional carving. I can turn it right on you. What got you into traditional carving? Yeah, so I guess for anybody who's, who's watching, I'm also a traditional woodcarver. So Justin and I, we, we have a similar approach to our practices. Um, but yeah, goodness, I, I get this question a lot, you know, like, you don't carve with power tools, are you crazy? And, you know, my answer is, yeah, probably, <laughs> you know, but there's, there's quite a few reasons for myself. Um, one you already touched on, it's a dying art form. I only know a handful of people and I haven't even met personally that are actually pursuing it and practicing it with a, a level of an intention where they're trying to take it to a professional level. They're trying to push the boundaries. It's not just a hobby. And that's something that we're really losing. We're losing that skill, you know? Very well put. Well, yeah, no, and uh, another thing I want to say is, uh, there's one thing, because we're very similar in this way too. Uh, we try to take our work to a different level. So what is it makes you, like people say, doing it by hand, but I also notice that uh, you take it to such a level with your sanding and whatnot that you actually go the extra mile. And obviously doing the, doing the hand power stuff doesn't bother you in one way or another? For, for myself, I, I don't even use power tools for sanding. 
I sand everything by hand. Regretfully. <laughs> I can speak from <laughs> yeah. I do the same thing out there, and I'll tell you what, I, everything he says, it's oh, for both man. of us, so we can go right ahead. Oh, I, I know I, I usually joke with people that I can't even call myself a woodcarver, I'm just a sander, because I spent so long, usually almost on par, as long as I spend carving a piece, I'll spend just about as long actually sanding it once it's done. And a lot of that is most definitely because the extra level of sanding that I, I try to take my work to, I could be done a lot sooner if we were to go by normal carpentry standards. Yes. So for some, for some context, for anybody who doesn't know a lot about woodworking, you, uh, you have a certain amount of grit for sandpaper. And so the smaller that number of grit is, the larger the actual rocks on the sandpaper are. Because you can only fit, if you have an 80 grit piece of sandpaper, you can only fit 80 pieces of that grit into a surface area on it. So the higher number you go, the finer and finer and finer it gets. So most carpenters will stop around anywhere between 220 mm -hmm. and 400 grit, mm -hmm. maybe 600 grit if they're going to a really fine level. And that's just because once you hit that level, that's where you stop seeing visible scratches on the wood. They're still there, no matter how fine you go, you're just making smaller and smaller scratches. But that's generally where most people stop because it's no longer a visible imperfection on the work. So do you want to share a little bit on how far, how far both of us go up, but also why? I will, but I also, I know why you do it right away because your pieces, your finished pieces, uh, once, once you look at them, um, people are going to understand why you go to that grit. But yes, uh, we like to, t I'm the same as Tim. Um, I don't know if it's because we're both part perfectionists or we just love it so much. I'm not really <laughs> sure what it is, but uh, I take mine to as high as we can find. Uh, we have found, I think, 7,000 is the highest we found so far, and that's what we sand to. The more we sand, uh, the more it brings out the beautiful grain of this wood. Mm. And that's something that we want to bring to the world, too, as a lot. It's about the resources. Uh, Tim did an article here uh, on me here in the latest issue of Created Here and it was uh, called The Age of Waste and to get back to the wood, like I said, we do it so well because it brings out the beautiful grain and it shows the wood but when we show the wood, we'll show the beauty of the wood because in the future we're not going to have this wood anymore. Yeah. As you probably read in the, in the article, there's only about 90 to 100 years they assume left of having this butternut so and we want to take that wood to a place where it is so beautiful that it just stops people in their tracks. And that's why I also, like you, put in the extra hours. And uh, me as well, that was well put. I at least spend as much time sanding as I do carving. Um, this piece alone, uh, right here, I probably have about 150 hours maybe carving in it. And I'm getting close to 100 and just sanding. <laughs> so, and I'm not done yet. I'm only right now, and everybody talking about grit right now, I'm at about 220. I've got to get to 7,000. It gets easier it goes, but still, it's still got some movement to go. And that, uh, that number might shock a lot of people who are viewing this. You know, 150 hours on carving. Like, why would that take so long? And I, I know I can, like you said, speak for both of us. Uh, wood carving is a subtractive art form. If you take a piece of wood off, you, you can't put it back. You, <laughs> like what you would approach with clay, where you can, you can build up, you could remove, you could add. It's, it's a very complicated process, even with clay, but you can actually build upon a piece. With wood, you can only subtract for actual, if you're doing carving. Mm. If you're doing construction, that's completely different. You're making something with different pieces. But for carving, like I know your piece here, it looks you know, monstrously huge right now, but I know from experience the log you had to start with would have been it two, took, three it, times as big. It took the two of us to move it, if you remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> but yes, that, that he's right about subtractive, so why it takes so long is I, we literally have to move all the wood that's all around us. You can, you can visualize that this is a full log, that we have to remove all the wood, get all the depth, get all the angles. So it really, yeah, you can see it right here. Yeah. So at one time, this was one full log that he's gone and he's moved everything away from it. And we've, we've only honestly been doing this for... A few, few years now. Yeah, yeah, I'd say three or four years now. 
And basically what I mean by that is every strike of the mallet, we're still learning, we're still going. It, it's getting better and faster, but it, it's a learning curve and it's fun actually to learn this craft. Absolutely. It bridges perfectly into uh, another reason why I, I intentionally choose to avoid power tools and just work with hand tools or traditional hand tools is you will learn to be a better carver by default. I, I can't blame any of the mistakes I make on the tools. They don't move on their own. There's no, there's no different settings or anything. Yep. Everything that you do, every piece of wood you remove is completely because of your own muscle movement. Well played. And same for sanding your work by hand. Honestly, that's probably made me a better carver than actually carving because having to fix all your mistakes in such a long, <laughs> slow process. Yes. Oh man. It is, you're right, your mistakes at the start, and that is how you fix them, and you do learn quickly. Absolutely. Uh, what would I like to bring up? I'd like to bring up anybody out there that's ever uh, thinking about actually getting into some traditional carving. Uh, highly recommend it. And maybe we could talk a little bit about what it's done for us. I know we talk about not using power tools, but for me personally, and I'll ask him right after too, um, is that it brings me closer to who I am. Once I start hitting that wood and manipulating that wood, or the wood manipulating me, I, I still haven't quite figured that out yet, who's doing what here. Because here I am saying that I'm removing all this, but this face wants to be seen. I, I'm, we're a lot like the same again, I'll get him to explain too, but I don't have a clue what, I, what I'm starting here. The face literally wants to have this face, and I just keep removing wood. I am following grain to a certain degree, so, when you put it that way, uh, it, it's the tree that's telling me what it wants to do. Um, but yeah, how about you? What? Yeah, it's very much the same way for myself. I, whenever I start a piece, like I, when I start this piece, I know it's going to be a face. I know that's my intention I'm, I'm going to work towards, but I have no idea any of the facial features and expression. I have no clue what I'm going to do with it. I just start carving and then eventually, you know, like, oh, this one's going to have eyes or this one's going to be frowning or, or there will be something actually in the grain of the wood, an imperfection or a knot in the tree right. that actually the tree dictates how it's going to look at the end. And I think that's a really mm. beautiful approach to it because we're working with a living material, you know? Yes, it's, indeed. It's, trees are a living part of nature. And it's still living still breathing so yeah absolutely uh, to get back to if anybody wants to get into it, what it does to us it, it grounds me it brings me closer to who I am mm -hmm. I know other people can different types of meditations walk in meditation every different this is a type of meditation as well so anybody out there that's really interested in checking it out and trying it I highly recommend it I haven't had anything ground me as much as doing this it's ex it's put it put me in perspective exactly who I am, where I am. Um, it's it's opened my mind to many things. Absolutely, and uh, I feel very much the same way. That's actually how I got into wood carving at all. Was I I just approached taking a, a weekend class for for that reason, just for a, a therapeutic approach to art. And <laughs> now here I am, you know. <laughs> Completely, completely in over my head, but uh, <laughs> I, I know I, modest. <laughs> I know I could speak uh, for other people I know as well because we separately and together have we've taught some courses on actually taking people who have no experience with wood carving in through doing their very first mask or a face. People really find it therapeutic. They find it healing. They do, and it's a way to connect with themselves. And then they, they, I find that they leave wanting more. So it's really an interesting thing. But I, we understand that totally because uh, it happened to us. So yeah, so anybody's out there uh, willing to uh, want to give it a try sometime, something like that, uh, I'm sure you can find our numbers and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, and everybody's really interested because uh, like I said, it's, it's the best meditation I personally have come across. And it's not just, we just don't, uh, I'll bring that up too. We just don't carve faces. Uh, we love carving faces. Um, it brings a lot of attention. Uh, that, but we carve many different things. As you can see, Tim over here right now. Ooh. Yes, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's wood. Tim has done a recreation here of uh, ancient Norse axe, I do believe. Yeah, so this, uh, this was just a, a fun experiment. 
I guess. So the body of work I've been working on the past few years is exploring specifically the pre-Christian Germanic European different groups and the myths and stories and some of the artifacts that Interesting. have survived to us. And some of the pieces I've done are, you know, that the originals have completely decomposed, they've been lost to history, and there's only a single drawing that remains of it now. And so I want to try to help preserve that for the future. That with a, sounds with a fun that, little twist. It wasn't the, it wasn't the wooden axe head. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. it was a ceremonial axe head. But you know, this is your spin on it. honestly, like as much as people might look at this as like, oh, this is really nice. This is intricately done. Honestly, it's we need to remember the craftsmanship from the past is at a level we we almost don't have anymore. Like certainly, no power tools whatsoever, and the original one, like all the design work you see was completely inlaid with silver and gold, and that's just mind blowing. It you is know? mind blowing, and it's and beautiful from over a thousand years ago. Right. Artwork is gorgeous. Uh, sounds very familiar. Uh, that's coming from that side of uh, the world, and over on this side of the world is basically that's why Tim and I actually one of the reasons why we get along so well is that we have very common thoughts. First of all, but what he's trying to do to some of his heritage is exactly what I'm trying to do to my heritage over here. We're trying. It's trying to be. <laughs> It was hidden for a long time, uh, destroyed, hidden, get rid of. We're trying to scrape and get as much as we can and bring it back. That's why I obviously I adore what he does because it's exactly what I want to do here, and that's and we feed it off each other when we do this. And these ancient designs, uh, him saying it's over a thousand years old, and I mean even looking at the design now, uh, it completely blows my mind. Like some of the designs I have are thousands of years old too, and some of my Wolstokoi stuff and my Beskunukadi stuff, and it truly blows my mind in the artwork. I see you've got uh, you you have one of your paddles up behind you as well. Yes, uh, when I got into carving, like I said, I uh, got into doing faces uh, like you, uh, and then when I got really closer to my roots, uh, when I started to do paddles. Because here on the East Coast, I like to tell people, like I know Ned Bear, everyone knows Ned Bear, or should know who Ned Bear is, and, and he brought back uh, face carving here to this East Coast. It had been gone for millennia. My people, uh, Pasquati and Mousy, both would do carvings, would do face carvings or mass carvings. But no one's done it for a long, long time, and Ned was the one to bring it back. So it is, it's something we did do here. Uh, I know people think a lot of this stuff comes from out West, but actually, we had it right here too. But there's a big difference I like to, uh, in some of my talks, uh, I like to show is people ask me, well, they're always West Coast, West Coast, West Coast Indigenous art. And I guess it's beautiful, but uh, I want to explain a couple different things here. Um, uh, the resources were different. Uh, it was much tougher here on the East Coast. Well, actually, first of all, we were contacted almost 400 years before. So they had 400 more years to work on their artwork, which is fantastic. But it's about uh, the way they live too. Uh, we were more nomadic on this end. So uh, in my people, if, you, if it didn't save your life or make your life better, they weren't carrying it. So when I got into doing this, I loved it because it felt good. But when I started, as Tim said, started getting into making hand-drawn paddles, everything changed for me to a whole nother level. Uh, when I started doing something that's actually and that's something I'm trying to bring up to the world too, is our artwork here on the East Coast is functional artwork. Like when you see a snowshoe, uh, like a 100-year-old snowshoe or 200-year-old snowshoe or a paddle, that's our artwork. It's absolutely beautiful, but it had to be functional. Anyway, and that's why I absolutely love doing the paddle work, and I've been going into communities and actually teaching some of my community members how to make paddles, and getting back to the healing part of it and the meditation part, it just makes it so much better. Because that's a, that's a historical design you have on the paddle as well. Yes, actually it is. Um, that, the design back here on this paddle is off of probably about a 250 to 300 year old uh, birch bark basket. And it's a uh, Passamaquoddy. Uh, this paddle right here is actually off of a 100 to 150 year old uh, Wollastoque or um, a Maliseet paddle. It's the exact replica of it. The design. And the the design of the paddle, yes. The, the shape of it. Uh, it's, it's our eastern, you can see, it is actually our eastern beaver tail. It's a little bit different than other beaver tails. 
And the one over here is a little bit special because this is my great, great uncle's paddle that he made himself and I did another replica of this one. This one will be a pass quality paddle, but it's just, <laughs> you can sit here and talk a lot about this, but we won't. But yes, yeah, so paddles define who we are. We were watershed people and you could tell where you're from by basically the type of water you're in and the paddle you were using. So it's really neat. I'm really getting into that now. But yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's a beautiful point too that the reason why a lot of the art, not just here, but in a lot of the different communities and indigenous communities around the globe, no matter how far back in history you go, the more land-based and more land-reliant, if we want to use that word, that different peoples are, the more functional their artwork mm. tends to be. Indeed. Because you're not, you're not stuck to a single location. You would be nomadic. You You'd would be move. Nomadic. Right. Yeah. You need the stuff that, that aided your life, helped your life, not Absolutely. impeded it, indeed. And that's another thing too, I don't want to get into this now, but I do, I've been doing a lot of talks and, and getting in, Tim getting into the land-based stuff, just one quick thing I want to bring up is that uh, I get into a lot of these talks and I speak into a group of people. And first I talk about my people and then the first time I bring up the word colonization. Mm. The group of people I've started to notice is the majority of, the, uh, of uh, the Caucasian people, the white people in the room, the first thing they do is that you can see their head drop when I say colonization. Out of, like out of shame or? I'm not sure. I just, boredom, no, I just noticed out of, a, a, out of the reaction. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if it's out of shame or if it's just out of like tired of hearing about it or I'm not sure what it is. But once I started noticing that, I noticed that it had an effect on people. And we had a conversation. This is why I really enjoy talking to Tim, is we had a conversation about land-based people and he quite, I'm so stuck in my East Coast uh, dawn land stuff that he enlightens me that this type of thing was going on with, our, with my people here on the East Coast has happened all over the world. We were all land-based people at one time. So, and me talking about, uh, when I do my talks, I'm like, listen, it's not, it's not about the color of your skin. It's uh, uh, your ancestors, doesn't matter if you're white, whatever, your ancestors at one time were land-based people as well. So it's actually been taken away. We have all have been colonized. So that's what I want people to realize. And once I implement that into my talks, people put their heads up and they want to listen a little bit more. So more people can realize that we're, we're a lot more alike than they think. We're not separate in any way. We're, we're the same. This has happened to everyone. It's just that you're hearing it more from my side and my people right now because it, it happened just recently. Mm. It touches yeah. more on the, the power dynamic of the situation or even the religious conflicts that have happened rather than just specifically skin color. Exactly, exactly. And we could get into much more depth on that, but maybe that'll be for another time. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, that's a, it's quite a long conversation, but the, you, you do bring up a good point that um, you know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people of, uh, you know, and like, well, I'm English. I don't have any, you know, like there's some cultural heritage there they acknowledge, but it's very, that's pretty much it, you know, and not many people have spoken to, have looked enough into history and I'm not, that's not their fault. It's something that's very much not discussed in, in our modern or present day, but you know, England wasn't always England. Before England, it was the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. But the Anglo-Saxons, like you had the Angles and you had the Saxons. Mm -hmm. The Saxons migrated during the early Germanic migration period to what is now England. You know, it's... And they were land-based? Yes, absolutely. And so you, you get a lot of neat crossover. You do. You get, you know, before the Christianization of that area, the peoples there in what is now modern day England, they practiced pre-Christian Germanic paganism. And, you know, that shares a lot of similarities to a lot of the indigenous cultures that have continued on and have stayed strong to this day. Most certainly has. And like I said, you've opened my mind and I love talking about this stuff because it just brings us closer and realizes that we are, we're the same. It doesn't really matter. But yeah, anything yeah. you want to get in. No, man, I, 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 I said with you, we could sit here and talk all day and we could touch on about 
don't know how many subjects, but absolutely. Like I, said, like I said, maybe we'll, we'll look into do more of this. Absolutely. <laughs> it's always a, a lifelong pursuit of, of knowledge. Indeed. And that's one thing that I do like is that with us, it is such a give and take. I'm learning from him every day. Hopefully he's learning from me every day. And yeah, it's been a very uh, good relationship. It's been a, I've learned so much and I want to thank you for that. No problem. Thank you. And uh, if you anybody's doing? interested in, in checking out any of your work or seeing some of your carvings, because I know we don't have a, you don't have a finished face yeah. here, finished spirit here today with you. Where could they check that out on? Well, a uh, place for me would be, I guess, Instagram, Justin Sapria. That's my thing. Uh, about it. Uh, I'm not usually on the computer too much, but I try to put my stuff on there. So if you want to check me out, that'd be the best place. At Justin Sapria and yourself. Thanks. Um, I'm, on, I'm also on Instagram and, and Facebook and YouTube. It's just at uh, Bjorn's Wood Carving is the username I use. Uh, I do have a website as well which would just be www.bjornswoodcarving.com and I've been trying to to make it a little more uh, interactive, a little more historical and to, so for every every piece I have up on there you can you can click on it, you can read the story, you can learn a bit about it, about the cultures. I put together a few papers that talk about things like the historical yes. different uh, North Art styles so you know, if, if you're interested in, in checking out D some more. Dusting up on some then, stuff, for sure. Yeah, there's some neat pictures on there, too. There is. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to say uh, Wuliwen uh, and Wuliwen Musan. And what that means is walking a good way. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much.